my gosh, I said a while ago, if each one of you will just take one more person to vote, we'll, we'll get him back in. So that's, I am so excited to be here and see all of you. People ask me, how do you keep doing what you do? People like you, people like you, people like New Hampshire, making a difference. That's what you and I are doing, and you and I are going to put Obama back in the White House four more years. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest of my story. I hate to tell you, Sylvia, I like what you said, that I was 70, but I hate to tell you, a couple of weeks ago, I turned 74. I am a widow. I am a widow. Looking for a new husband. I tried to recruit some of those young guys working in Washington last week. Watch me now. I you guys. But no, I'm, I'm serious now. This is a wonderful crowd. You're energized. And that's what keeps me young and on the road and in the air. Because I like what I'm doing because I found out after working 19 years and 10 months for a company that they were cheating me and they're cheating me for the rest of my life. And there's nothing I can do to help myself. But when I started my journey, I stood up for Lily Ledbetter because that's who I was interested in because I'd been wrong. And now I fight for all of you because I lost my case, but I hired in with Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company in 1979 as a first line supervisor in their tire factory. Prior to that, I'd been a district manager for H&R Block, managing 16 locations. Prior to that, I was assistant financial aid director at Jacksonville State University. I moved on because my life's goal, being born and reared in the poorest county of Alabama, very poor, and coming up the hard way, and living through some awfully hard times, my goal in life was to get a good job, make as much money as possible, raise my family, save, build a nest egg, and someday I could retire and enjoy what I had built. But I found out after 19 years that my employer did not live up to their end of the bargain. I hired in, and then in 19, early 90s, Goodyear Gadsden started a light truck radio division. They handpicked four managers. I was one of those four because of my management style and the way I worked with my people. That was quite an honor for this female. And then we had to go to engineering school because we took over the Krauss people on our ship. I finished second out of 150 people in pipe fitting, electric, and rail lines. In 1995, 96, they gave me a top performance award because they said I did an outstanding job. They said at trial, though, they was just trying to even out my pay. And the judge said, oh, you realized you were shortchanging her. Well, that hushed that. At trial, I had two women who testified on my behalf. They asked one of them why she never complained. She said, I was a divorced mother with a handicapped son. Live paycheck to paycheck. I knew if I brought up my pay, I would not have a job. So you get held back. There's nothing you can do. But when I saw that note, when I went into work that evening, I couldn't believe it. When I saw those four names, we four had the same job. My pay compared to theirs was 40% less than either one of theirs. And that was just the base pay. So first line management got overtime, time and half, double and triple. That cost me and my family a lot of money and made life a lot harder in Alabama than it should have been. I was devastated and humiliated and finally got up enough of courage to do my start my shift. And then it hit me. My retirement, my contributory retirement, my 401k, and today my Social Security all was based on what I heard. I thought about that the rest of my shift, and I got home, and I said to my husband, I have to file a charge with the Equal Employment Commission, two years away from retirement, but I couldn't let it go because that's not who I am. This was against the law. That major corporation had broke the law, and I was not the only one. But I was standing up for Lily Ledbetter at that time. He said, what time do you want to leave? 
We drove to Birmingham, 75 miles from where I live. I filed my charge, and in a few months, they called, said, you've got one of the best cases we've ever seen. But you may want to get your own attorney. You'll probably get to federal trial faster. I found an attorney in Birmingham that took my case on a contingent basis. Because you see people in middle America, middle class, we don't have money that can hire an attorney and life for eight years. It actually took me nine years. It took me nine years from 1998. I filed the charge until I got the final verdict in May of 07. My attorney, we went to federal trial and the jury came back with a verdict $3.8 million. But the judge had to tell the court and me and the lawyers that I was only entitled to $300,000. So my $3 million dropped to $300,000. Back pay, you can only go back two years on equal pay. So these opponents out here in New Hampshire that is saying the Ledbetter law is a nuisance and it's a lawyer's dream, no. Because lawyers don't make money on cases like mine and neither do the, complaint, the person like myself filing the charges. Because you're in it a long time and life goes on. My husband developed cancer. He had three and then he had the left side of his face removed two weeks prior going to the Supreme Court. When I got back to Alabama, we had 34 radiation and chemo treatments, and I continually went back and forth to Washington lobbying for the bill. But I couldn't let it go, I couldn't let it go then, and I'm still very passionate about what I talk about today, because today it's no longer about Lily Ledbetter. It touches each one of you in this room. If not you directly, indirectly, it has touched you some way or other, and it's all across this nation. And the men get it. I'm impressed seeing the guys here tonight because it touches you too. You have a mother, you have a wife, you have a sister, you have daughters. It touches everybody. But after the verdict, and I love the headlines, they still read, Jacksonville, Alabama woman awarded 3.8 million. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> I did. But Goodyear appealed and we ended up in the Supreme Court in 06. The verdict came out in 07. And Justice Alito said, I should have filed my charge the first discriminatory paycheck I got. Even though I had no idea that I was being discriminated against and had no way to prove it. Had no idea that I was being so short-changed. But the jury gave me that large verdict trying to make up for all of the lost overtime and future retirements. Even the Congress tried when they got the Ledbetter bill negotiated. They wanted to make it where it would cover me. But though that don't work, it never does. They, it sounds good, but the two attorneys that they told me said, don't get your hopes up, we've never seen it work. But what I wanted from that point on was the bill to be passed. Congressman George Miller's committee called and named the bill for me, and I'm told in Alabama I'm the only Alabamian with a bill named for them, and it's less than 35 in the history. So I'm in a unique place, and it's like I told President Obama, he gave me a tremendous responsibility that I have to live up to because I can't drop it because it means so much to the families across this nation. And this bill was supported by Republicans and Democrats, and it was voted on and passed by both parties. But we had to get President Obama elected to get it signed into law because the previous administration would have never let it go. It would have never made it through and got signed. When I went to Denver to speak at the Democratic Convention, I went, <coughs> not endorsing Obama, because I went like John Ray, uh, uh, Reagan did in, for John Kerry. I didn't endorse him, but when I saw the women's tears and the emotion in the audience and the men said, yes, we can. I walked off the stage and that first reporter said, when did you endorse Obama? I said, right tonight. <laughs> because I knew it was time for me to get off the fence and go with that. And that's exactly what I did. And I have never regretted one minute of it because it has meant so much. I was in the balcony last November when we voted on paycheck fairness fell by two votes. Every Democrat but one voted for it. No Republican would walk across that aisle. And folks, you and I are here tonight because we care about our families. 
We care about the rights that women have, and we don't have that many. I've learned this. I've had a good history lesson since I've got into this. We don't have that many rights. We've not even been voting 100 years yet. And our reproductive rights, our medical, our uh, pills, our medication, our insurance, they don't want them to cover. You can't have an abortion. You'll just have to die. If they reverse Roe versus right way, I said this on Chris Matthews' show not long ago. It dates me, but I remember when Roe versus Wade became a law and the people in my part of the country was dying when they needed an abortion to save their life because not a doctor or a hospital would touch them, even to save their life. If they had the money, they could go out of the country. But if they didn't, they had to go to a back alley and nine times out of ten, they did not live. We do not need to go back. We need to go forward because there is much work yet to be done. And what the president has done in his first three years, he has lived up to everything that he committed himself to do. And he's got so many programs started. <laughs> he has to stay four more. And this talking about this being a lawyer's dream, I will tell you this. Most lawyers cannot take a case and stay with it eight and nine years without making money. And there's not any money. They said when we were trying to get the bill passed that it would open up a flood of lawsuits. There never had been and there never will be. And I'd like each one of you to understand tonight, the law was on my side. That's why we went as far as we did. Because the law had always been based on paycheck accrual. If an individual is still getting a check, then you've got the right when you find out that you're being discriminated 180 days to file a charge. And that's what we did. The law, the Ledbetter bill just puts us back to where we were prior to the ruling in my case. We need to go forward. We need some more progress. And that's what the president will give us. And that's why we need to flood Washington, the House, and the Senate with as many Democrats from every part of the country and the nation. You need them in your state. You need to put them in your state, by the way. I don't even know what you got here. I've heard a little bit. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what we got in Alabama. They snuck one in on us. They, we've got all Republicans. We had some Democrats elected, but after they got into office, they were told, you'll never get elected again if you don't change parties. So we only have two people that represent us where I live in Montgomery, Alabama, that still are Democrats. But we're going to prove to them next time we're going to take a lot of them out because we're gearing up and getting ready. And that's what we got to wake up, we got to be alert, and stay ahead of them because they're sneaking things in on us everywhere across the country. And I'll admit, I had no idea what they was doing in Alabama until they did it. But we're not going to let this happen anymore, I hope. Thank you for being here. everything each one of you does to help make this a successful year to put some Democrats back into Washington. Thank you and God bless each one of you. about 10 minutes and I'm going to be the bad person when it's time to cut it off so she doesn't have to. Uh, and Ms. Lily, before we start the questions, I want to say in my mind, you are the Rosa Parks of our time. Oh my! I have four checks off until the bill was signed. 
But in my head, I feel like I do better getting all you folks re-elected or elected first time across the country and the nation. And you know, this, when the bill was signed in January of 2009, the, one of the biggest invitations I got was to Rome Italy. They have the same problem. The Italians paid for me and the Washington lawyer to go to Italy. And we stayed six days and, to share my story. And uh, the Japanese have come to this country and interviewed me and the French and Chile and, and London, England. So everybody's got this problem. But this country needs to pull out front and be number one again. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Another question? We still have some time. I can't get got right one here. Could you explain how the Equal Pay Act would work? How is it more than what we've got now? <coughs> they, uh, I understand they're trying to pass an Equal Pay Act. You paycheck fairness. Pay, paycheck paycheck fairness. Why, how it would have benefited me would have been that I could have found out. I could have asked my co-worker in, in the break room or outside the factory how much they made and we could talk about it without retaliation. And if I got retaliation, I'd have a law to fall back on. And uh, this is hard for the American families to fight because most employers do not require, I mean, they require their people to never discuss their pay. I just heard up on a college campus recently where last summer the college people went to a big home supply place and got jobs. They paid the African American girl on one cash register $8.50 an hour and the white man, white boy, on the other one, $9 an hour. Somebody in the back of the room said, why didn't you quit? She said, it was June and I needed that job and it paid more than anybody else even at $8.50. I couldn't come back to school if I didn't keep it. That's why we have to fight with these changes so that these people don't have to accept that. And I hear stories from people that's working two jobs, and another day on the weekend, they still can't pay their bills. This is not right. And the other problem in this country right now are women like myself, who we become widow, outliving our husbands by 10 years, and so many of them are having to move in their children's home. Now their children are having, trying to have a normal family life with their children, and, and it's an extra expense, too. And a lot of the military families have fallen into this. That means when they transfer, their mother will have to go with them. And she doesn't want to be there. She wants to be somewhere in her own place. It's not because she didn't work. It's because she didn't get the retirement she was entitled to. There's a lot out there. This plan. I, I hope I live to see the cap come off, too. Not anybody in my case then if they get the verdict, I hope they're entitled to get it, not have it adjusted. Goodyear said I was a poor performer, but they kept me for 20 years. <laughs> and they wished I'd come to them first. I did. And my boss said I was listening to too, me, too much BS from the men. So you got the door shut just about everywhere you go. And I can't let it go today. One of the reporters that interviewed me recently, this afternoon, in fact, she said, you sure are fired up. I said, yeah, that's the way I get. I can't let it go because when one of the ladies here said, you know, you really do a good job, but you need to smile more. Said, well, this right here is really serious to me. When you talk about your money and your family life and the stability of this country and this nation, because... When employers treat their people right and pay them right, we women turn that money around in the community, benefiting our families. We get a better house, we get a better car, the children have better education, they get their braces and their teeth fixed, and we're just better all around. And it makes the community and the state and the nation a stronger place to live. <laughs> I'll take an answer, too, if you got an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I just want to say you speak with such tremendous credibility and come from an experience that a lot of us in this room don't have. And I'm just wondering, as you go around and you tell your story, I bet you talk to people that you can win over in ways that uh, they don't expect because 
of where you've come from and what your story is. And I'm wondering if you could say anything about how we can be the best ambassadors possible for Barack Obama and for the ideals that you've talked about here tonight. That's a great question. That's awesome. That is. That's awesome. And you, you put it really good. One thing is to know his agenda and how he com how his competitor is. The reporter today asked me why I thought Obama was better. I said, well, let me tell you what I tell all the audiences I get to speak with. <coughs> Look at their record. What was his record in Massachusetts? Don't listen to what he's saying. Don't read the headlines. Don't read, don't watch the TV programs and make your voting decisions. You need the basic on what they've done. What was his record? Did he support women? No. Is he going to support the Ledbetter bill? Probably not. It took six seconds for them to answer on the TV program. We'll get back to you. That should have been a no-brainer. Yes, we're not voting. We're not repelling that because it's for every American family across this nation. And, but know his agenda. Know what Obama is standing for. Know what he's done. And when you get that in your heart and your mind, you'll go out there and you'll be so passionate. You'll have them and they'll be wanting to go vote. That's what I believe because that's how I got hooked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, Thank so you. much. Thank you. I will be on uh, Lawrence O'Donnell tonight if you can stay up that night. It's sort of hard for me. I'll have to my bedtime, but I'll be on Lawrence O'Donnell tonight.